we're going to look at Miller indices and we're going to start out using this very nice figure from Dexter Perkins where he's illustrating an octahedron and variations on a theme. So we're going to use that octahedron as an example. Miller indices are a way of identifying faces on a particular crystal. So we have, we have A, B, and C axes, crystallographic axes. The indices are a way of indexing the face relative to those axes. Let's erase the chalkboard for a moment. So we'll come back and we will redraw the crystallographic axes. So we'll have a very long C, B, and A axis so we can write some numbers on these. So let's say we measure out some distance, one, two, three, these distances can be rather arbitrarily defined. We can measure out distances along the B axis, one, two, three, et cetera and one, two, three, et cetera, along the c-axis. So let's say, like in that octahedron, we have a uh, crystal face that intersects, let's say, that the a-axis at two, and then the b-axis at two, and then the c-axis at two. So we would have a face that looks like this. Right? So what would be... What would be the Miller indices for that face? Well, we would write the intercepts as 1a, 1b, oh, excuse me, 2a, 2b, and 2c, right? So these numbers here, the 2b corresponds to the fact that our face intersects the b-axis at 2, uh, and et cetera, for a and c. Uh, these are not the Miller indices. These are just simply the intercepts. So then what we will do to get the Miller indices is that we will invert those intercepts. So we will have 1 over 2, 1 over 2, and 1 over 2. So we invert, that is step 2. So step 1, we establish the intercepts. Step 2, we will invert. And then in step 3, we will clear the fractions. It's supposed to be an L, so clear the fractions. And in clearing the fractions, that'll be pretty easy to do. Everything has 2 as a denominator, so we can multiply by 2. And so when we multiply by uh, 2 all the way across, a, b, and c, we end up with the values 1, 1, 1. If we put rounded parentheses uh, about those numbers, then we have the Miller indices for that face. That is an I there for indices, plural of index. Uh, it is these round brackets that make it a Miller index. If you used curly brackets or square brackets, then it would not meet, be a Miller index or a set of Miller indices. It would be something else, as we'll look at in a different video. So now let's clear the chalkboard and look at the same system again. What if instead of 222, two, two, what if we have everything intersecting at three? So let's say, uh, we don't have to write all the numbers. Let's say that along the A, B, and C axes, we have a face that intersects A and B and C all at some arbitrary distance three. So that means our intercepts would be 3A 3b and 3c. So that's step one, we've established the intercepts. Step two, we would want to invert the fractions. We would have 1 over 3, 1 over 3, and 1 over 3. Then we'd want to clear the fractions by multiplying everything by 3, uh, and we would end up, lo and behold, with 1, 1, 1. This is exactly what we got in the case of the intercepts of 2a, 2b, and 2c. We get the exact same Miller indices. And this is on purpose. This system was designed so that when we're looking at a particular face, for example, that octahedron at the beginning of this uh, video, that it doesn't matter how big the face is. We can have a, a small face or a larger face. That face is going to be defined by the same kinds of physical properties. If 
you look at the electrical conductivity across that face or the thermal conductivity across that face. It won't really matter whether that face is small or very, very large. It'll have the same physical properties. Its hardness would be the same. The kinds of bonds that the atoms and molecules along that face would uh, exhibit would be the same. So in this case, uh, the size of that face does not matter. And so the Miller indices are specifically designed with that, this idea in mind that we can identify faces that have a certain characteristic, and we can just call them all 1, 1, 1 if they intersect the A, B, and C at the positive uh, ends of those axes. So what we haven't yet talked about is what about the negative side. So let's redraw our A, B, and C axes. Now, when we draw these, uh, it is always positive in front, and this would be negative A in back, positive B, positive C, and then negative C. So what if we had something that hit the A axis at, let's say, negative 2, uh, and at the B axis at negative 2, and let's say the C axis at negative 2. So we would have this face down here. It would look something like that. So what would be the index for that face? Well, we, our indices would be negative 2a, negative 2b, negative 2c. We would still go through the same set of operations. We would invert the fractions. So now we have 1 over minus 2, 1 over minus 2, and 1 over minus 2. Uh, we can multiply out by 2. To, get the, to clear the fractions, uh, and that would give us minus 1, minus 1, and minus 1. What we're going to do is a little bit of a trick. Uh, instead of leaving the minus sign there, we're just going to put a bar over each of these, and that'll mean a minus 1. So these would be the Miller indices for the face that is hitting these at the negative side. And you can have some combination of negative and positive. You could probably see a pattern now. So let's say we had the face that hit C at the positive one, but A at the negative one, and then B at the negative one. So what about this face over here? Then that would be negative one A, uh, negative one B, but positive one C. So we would have one over minus one, one over minus one, and then 1 over 1 when we invert. And then when we clear the fractions, we would have minus 1, minus 1, 1. And we could just make the first two a bar 1. And then the last one would be positive. And that would be our Miller index for uh, this face back here. It hits the C at the positive 1 value, but then the B and A at negative values. Let's finish this up with one last kind of notation. So in the case of the octahedron, we have all of these triangular faces that hit at various points along these axes, but they're all the same. They have the same uh, chemical and physical properties. They will, this face will conduct electricity and heat the same way that this face down here would. So we can have the 111, or the bar 1, bar 1, 1, as we've seen already, or 1, bar 1, 1, etc. If they're all the same, what we could do is write curly brackets and just designate them all like that. So when you see these curly brackets, it just means you take the whole set of all of the possible combinations here. And that would be the set of Miller indices that would reflect the faces on that object.